And welcome to my presentation today. For those who don't know me, my name is Juan and I'm an Icon Z creator located here in Toronto, Canada. Uh, today, I have a very special presentation for you all where I'll be talking to you a little bit about landscape, nature and outdoor photography. And we're gonna dive into various different subjects and aspects of this field. Uh, so thank you for stopping by today. I hope with this presentation, you get inspired to go out and shoot some outdoor photography of your own. And then uh, you get to try some of the tips that I'll be going over in the next, next few slides. So let's get started. All right, so before we begin, I wanna introduce the agenda for today's presentation. Uh, first, I wanna give a small introduction about myself and who I am. Uh, next, we're gonna talk about the gear that I use for all my outdoor photography, just so you guys have an idea of what my go-to gear is. Uh, third, we're gonna talk about my preferred nature and outdoor uh, camera settings um, and how they all play a part in what you're trying to shoot. Uh, next, I'm gonna go over two of my favorite settings or uh, tips for outdoor uh, creative photography um, that I think you should also try as well. Uh, and then fifth, I wanna talk a little bit about how to find beauty in your surroundings when you're out shooting uh, your nature scenes or your own uh, landscape photography. And then we're gonna talk about two tips that allowed me to get a deeper connection with the outdoors and with photography. Um, and lastly, as a theme of this presentation, I'm gonna be talking about uh, ways that I like to say inspired um, and how I believe you can also stay inspired when you're out shooting uh, some landscape and outdoor photography of your own. All right, so I wanna begin by introducing myself. For those who don't know me, um, I'm a photographer based out of Toronto, Canada. Um, I specialize in everything relating to the outdoors. Um, a little bit of my career in the field, I actually picked up my first uh, camera. It was a Nikon camera, the uh, D5300. And at this time I began to shoot everything and any, anything from street photography to landscapes to architectures and even some portraits here and there. Um, I called myself a generalist photographer as, as uh, I just really enjoy the process of going out to shoot various locations and different subjects. Um, but it was around 2019 that my friends and I began to spend a lot of time with the outdoors and we began to going on hikes on many of the parks that we are, are offered here in, our, here in Ontario. Um, and I just began to bring my camera on these, these adventures. Um, so as I began to spend a lot more time with the outdoor scenes, I realized that this is really what I wanted to focus on um, and photograph at the end of the day. So it was here that I began to take my photography hobby a little more serious. Um, and then I began to post my work online. And it was in early 2021 where I began partnering with Nikon Canada uh, to work on exciting projects and connect with many other uh, Nikon photographers in the area. Um, I should mention that I like to call myself an outdoor photographer and not specifically a landscape photographer because I enjoy the process of not only going to photograph beautiful landscapes, but I also like to shoot nature and macro, uh, wildlife, and even some night or astrophotography. All right, so before we begin to talk about everything relating to the outdoor photography, um, although not super important, as I believe the main uh, or the best tool to capture your photos is the one you currently have, um, I thought I would mention my current gear in case anyone was wondering. Plus, I've also given a small description on the photos that I have, just so you guys can see the settings that I use, plus the locations in case you guys are looking to visit them as well. So, um, so once the Nikon system came out and I began to take my photography a lot more serious, I decided to upgrade from my Nikon D5300 um, and get myself a mirrorless Nikon Z6. 
um, I was I, I realized how sharp the lenses were and I knew this would take my photography to the next level. So I paired the Z6 with the 24 to 70 f4. Um, a lot of people like to call it the lens, the kit lens. And to be honest, it doesn't even fit like a kit lens because of how sharp the photos are. It, it's probably my main go to lens that I use right now. Um, I also paired the 24 to 70 f4 with the 14 to 30 millimeter f4, uh, the Z mount. Um, as well as I bought myself a 70 to 200 f4 that I use with an FTZ adapter. Uh, and this pretty much gives me anything or allows me to capture anything and everything from uh, very wide angle lens uh, shots all the way to very zoomed in shots to 200 millimeters. Um, I also like to carry with me a Z85 1.8 and a uh, 50 1.8 for those times that I wanna have a little bit more detail in my shots or I wanna create that uh, nice blurry background um, or, or even portraits sometimes, I, I like to use these lenses. Um, another camera that I, that I like to bring with me on my adventures uh, when I'm out shooting and I want a lighter setup is the Nikon ZFC. Um, this little camera also offers amazing image quality, plus the fact that it records in 4K means that you only need to carry one camera with you to shoot both uh, really nice photos plus uh, high quality video. Uh, so if you're looking for to vlog or just record your adventures, I really recommend that that uh, that camera. So when I'm out going to um, to shoot my outdoor photography, um, there are various accessory accessories that I like to bring with me, which I believe are key to capturing all types of shots. Um, first is a travel tripod. Um, I believe these are key to uh, in this field in order to allow you to capture sharp photos, allowing your your camera to be as stable as possible. Um, they're almost mandatory when you're using slow shutter speed. Uh, for example, when you're shooting uh, smooth water or even night photography because your camera needs to be as stable as possible to gather as much light into the lens as possible. Um, what I like about travel tripods is that they also force you to slow down time and really think about the shot and the composition that you're trying to get. Uh, when you're carrying a camera, for example, in your hand, you tend to photograph everything and anything that, that comes across you. Um, and you don't really give it much thought, but when you carry a travel tripod, you're forced to slow down time and prepare and look at what's in front of you before you start taking your photos. Um, I also like to carry with me a lens filter, primarily ND filters. Um, and these act almost as, almost as uh, sunglasses for your, your lens because they reduce the amount of light that's entering the lens. Um, they allow for longer shutter speed. And again, they work great, for example, when you're shooting uh, waterfalls. Um, lastly, I also like to bring extra memory cards, um, a headlamp in case you're out shooting later at night and you're not able to see anything that's around you. Um, a remote shutter release is also super imp important to reduce the uh, shake on the camera. For example, when you're shooting night photography and you don't want to um, shake the camera too much by clicking the shutter button, uh, it's almost mandatory when you're shooting Astro. Um, and lastly, I like to carry with me also an L bracket that allows you to position your camera both in uh, landscape and portrait mode. So that if you're looking to upload, for example, to Instagram, then you don't have to worry about um, cropping your photo in post-production. All right, so you might be curious how out of all the things that I began to shoot from street to portrait to architecture, why I decided to focus on outdoor photography. And to be honest, there are many reasons why this is and why I think you should also give outdoor photography a try. So to start, and the main reason is due to the vast amount of sceneries that are available. Um, everywhere you visit, whether that is in your own backyard or a national park, each scene offers uh, very different and unique uh, views all throughout the, um, the year. For example, if you're out shooting in summer or fall or winter, so there is never a bad time to shoot. Um, there is also no limitations and no perfect time to shoot either. Uh, many people may say that the best time to shoot uh, beautiful landscape sceneries is either, for example, in sunrise or sunset due to the colors in the sky. But in reality, there is no ideal or perfect time to shoot as every hour in the day offers unique and beautiful light. Um, what's also great about this field of photography is that uh, no matter if two people visit the same location, each is gonna come out with very unique and creative compositions. Um, everyone sees the landscape very differently from one another um, and in turn allows everyone in the field to be creative and compose a shot. They weigh the experience, the environment around them. Um, the last reason and my favorite is because it forces you to go outside on adventures. Um, many times you have to drive to further locations, maybe some some uh, some hours away, um, because you're looking for that perfect shot, uh, shot that perfect lighting, um, and that in itself creates an adventure 
if you're out shooting on your own or if you're out with friends. Uh, sometimes you have to pack your, your bags the night before, uh, prepare days in advance uh, because you're looking for that right or perfect timing. And that in itself gives you something to look forward to. So these are just a few reasons of why I love this field of photography and why I think you should try um, outdoor photography as well. All right. So I want to start talking about what kind of settings I recommend for your camera when you're out shooting the outdoors. Um, although the Nikon cameras have many features and settings which can be tailored depending on what you want to shoot, um, I believe there are three main settings which I think are important to discuss for today's presentation and relate to the outdoor sceneries. Um, and then, uh, so that's the focal length. Um, we're also going to talk about the aperture on your lens and how important that is depending on what it is that you're shooting. And third, uh, we can also talk about how to go about focusing your shot after you have found your composition. And we're going to be talking about both um, autofocus and manual focus and how each one benefits depending on the setting. Uh, so all these settings are going to allow you to get sharp images as well as be ready for any location that you might find yourself in. So the first and one which I believe, believe is key to allow you to capture unique locations is understanding how the focal length plays a part in your shot. Um, when you're out shooting landscape sceneries, it's preferred that you have a wide angle lens uh, with you because this is gonna allow you to capture as much of the scene as possible. Uh, something, for example, between a 14 to 35 millimeters is considered a wide angle lens on a full frame camera. Um, this Having this type of lens is great because it allows you to show your viewer what the entire scene looks like. Um, many times you have a beautiful foreground such as a lake or you have uh, the mountains in the background and even the sky. So a wide angle lens will allow you to capture all of this in a single shot. Uh, what's also great about wide angle lenses is that they allow you to, um, to create a lot of depth in your, in your image because you're able to capture everything from the foreground to the midground to the background. Um, and what's also unique about this lens is that it tends to create a lot of distortion, uh, which you can use to your advantage to be extra creative. So for example, you can make objects in the foreground appear much larger than they actually are, or you can make objects in the further uh, distance appear further away than they actually are, depending on where you place your subject in, in your frame. Uh, something you do wanna keep in mind with this lens is that if you're including both the foreground and the sky, you wanna make sure that they, these are very strong subjects or else your image will lack a little bit of context. Um, my tip with this lens is you want to almost lead the viewer into a journey with your photo where they begin by noticing the foreground, followed by the midground, and then the sky or what you're trying to compose in the background. Uh, this is really what's going to make a strong composition and make your images have a strong impact on your viewers. So here we have, for example, a shot of a wide angle taken with the 14 to 30 f4. Um, and as you can see with the shot, I have taken into consider consideration both the foreground, the midground, and the background. And I have used a bridge as a way to lead the viewer's eyes towards the mountains in the background. The image is very captivating, as even the clouds, as you can see, um, the way it's shaped, it creates a very dynamic moment in your photo, a movement in your photo. Um, and it also creates a lot of depth, almost making your image feel like it has a 3D feel to it. Um, and you, as you can see with, with the settings here, the shot was taken at uh, 14 millimeters, which is on the extreme end of the wide angle lens. Uh, therefore, you're able to include a lot of the scene, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, this next shot was actually taken with my uh, Nikon D5300 at a focal length equivalent of about 30 millimeter, millimeters on a full frame camera. Uh, and with this shot, I actually tilted the camera slightly downward to capture more of the foreground and less of the sky because it was just a clear blue sky, so it didn't make sense uh, to add to the composition. Uh, with this focal length, you're actually able to include a larger scene while taking into consideration the foreground, the midground, and the background. Um, it's also important to have a strong subject when you're using wide angle lenses, or else the viewer won't really know where to place the, uh, their eyes on the image. Uh, with this last shot, as you guys see in the, in the settings, um, the focal length is actually a 70 to 200. Um, and I want to mention, you shouldn't limit yourself to uh, taking outdoor outdoor photos with, uh, with uh, wide angle lenses, because there's a lot of lenses that you can use to capture more details in your shots. Um, if, for example, if, if I would have used a wide angle lens in this case, the trees in the background would have appeared very further away from the tree and it wouldn't have made sense or I wouldn't have gathered much impact into the photo. 
so ideally you want to learn how to work with various focal lengths and this is what's going to allow you to uh, to have a greater advantage um, at taking outdoor scenes um, and then giving your shots uh, more importance in, in more importance in in uh, in your scene so the next important setting that you want to focus on when you're taking outdoor shots um, is your aperture so unlike when you're shooting portraits and you want to have that smooth, blurry background and you just want to have your subject in focus, um, in landscape and outdoor photography, most of the time you want to have the entire plane in focus from front to back. And this can be achieved by multiple, multiple ways, but one of the ways that it can be done is by increasing your aperture. Uh, when you begin to increase your aperture, you're actually able to maximize the depth of field. Um, and this means when you shoot be, um, at a higher f-stop, for example, at f8 or higher. Um, I personally tend to shoot at around f11 most of the time because I believe this is where most of my lenses are the sharpest. Um, but ideally, you want to test out all your lenses at various f-stops and see where you're able to, to get the sharpest shot and find that sweet spot um, where you can have everything in focus plus get your image as sharp as possible. Um, a lot of people ask me, hey, why don't you get, for example, the 14 to 24 2.8 um, since it can let in more light? Um, and the main reason I don't get these type of lenses is because my shots are never actually taken uh, with the slower uh, aperture, for example, at f8. Uh, therefore, uh, most of the time I use my 14 to 30 f4, and this gives me enough, uh, or this gives me great results for the type of shots that I'm looking to get. Um, plus, the fact that the 14 to 30 is also so lightweight and sharp edge to edge um, means that I can bring on this lens in multiple scenarios. Um, and any type of scene is going to allow me to, to, uh, to use this lens for those type of shots. Um, this next shot, for example, uh, this was taken this past fall in Quebec. And in order to maximize my depth, my depth of field and have both myself and the background in focus, what I decided to do is to uh, take the shot on a tripod at f14. Um, this allowed me to give focus not only to myself in the foreground, as well as the hills and the sky in the background, giving more context to what it is that I'm looking at. Um, if this shot, for example, would have been taken in at 1.8 and the focus would have been on me, then the subject in the background would have lost uh, importance. So shooting at a higher aperture assured me I would get the entire scene in focus and be able to portray everything that I'm looking at. Um, this next shot was, at, was uh, taken at a woodland scene not too far away from my home. Um, and with this shot, I had to take into consideration various settings in my camera uh, for, for multiple reasons. Uh, not only did I have a slower shutter speed so I could capture the movement of the water, but I also wanted to have everything from the foreground all the way to the branches and the trees in focus. Um, so unfortunately, with I didn't have an ND filter with, with me that day in order to, to, to get the, uh, the smooth water. So my only option here was to raise my aperture to have a slow enough shutter speed since my eye is always already at the lowest point. Ideally, you don't want to shoot your shots um, with very high aperture because it creates a lot of diffraction. Um, but in, if, for example, in this shot, I didn't have any other option. So this was uh, this was why I had to increase the, uh, the aperture to F16. Um, now, this shot could have been done in, in multiple ways to maximize the depth of field, which I'm actually going to be going over in the next few slides. Um, but unfortunately, I did not have a tripod with me in order to take multiple shots and grab everything in focus. Um, here's another shot taken at a higher aperture where I had to take into consideration uh, what part of the image I wanted to be in focus. Um, it didn't make sense for me to have uh, to take the image at a lower um, aperture, meaning at f4 or uh, or uh, faster, because I wanted everything to be to be sharp. Uh, something that's also great about the, the uh, taking photos at higher aperture is that. Uh, when you position the front, the sun in front of your lens, you're able to get these beautiful sun stars that you can use to create very dynamic shots in your image. Uh, when you shoot a very high aperture, for example, anywhere from f16 all the way to f22 or f32, uh, depending on your lenses, you, um, the light entering the lens actually gets diffracted across the aperture blades in your lenses, and it creates beautiful point of star. Uh, that's just another advantage of shooting higher aperture, which can be used to, to make uh, creative photos. All right, so the last camera setting that I think is important for outdoor and landscape sceneries is understanding how the focusing, um, how you can go about focusing on your image. Um, 
focusing is super important because it could ideally make or break uh, your photo, making it possibly unusable. Um, landscapes, uh, for the most part, are pretty straightforward to focus on. Um, because they're stationary objects and things happen, uh, happen at a much slower, lower pace, uh, meaning you can maintain your camera settings for a little longer and have sharp, have sharp photos every single time. In other photography genres, such as wildlife uh, or sports, where things are moving very quickly and you have to keep adjusting your settings very fast, um, so it makes it a bit more challenging for the camera to, uh, to focus on, on the single subjects. Um, for the most part, using autofocus will get the job done as the camera is able to detect what it is that you're looking at. Um, autofocus is also much faster and convenient when you, when you don't have to adjust the focus every time to capture the different scenes. Um, and some, sometimes objects may, may be moving quickly uh, towards the, the lens or away from the lens, making it more difficult for the camera to pick up these, sub, these subjects. Um, so in that case, you would use manual focus, which we're going to talk about uh, in the next few slides. Um, so you might ask yourself, with such a wide angle view, where exactly do you focus on your image? Uh, since we are trying to focus on the entire scene and not a single subject, we can't focus on objects that are either too close or too far. So the best technique is to focus about one third of the way into your scene, as this will maximize the depth of field. Uh, this method combined with having a higher aperture is gonna ensure that you have your entire scene from focus front to back. Uh, what's also important to remember though, is to ask yourself what it is that you're actually trying to focus on your image, or do I want to give emphasis to? Um, is there a specific subject in your frame, or like a certain rock, or a certain tree, or for example, the train here that you want to uh, focus on? So think about this before you begin to choose your subject, your uh, focus points. In this image, for example, I place my focus about uh, one one third of uh, up from the image uh, because I wanted to have the the um, the background is sharp and the foreground as well. Um, on the other hand, if I would have put my focus point, for example, in the mountains in the background, uh, the foreground would have been out of focus. Therefore, I've placed my focus point about one third of the, of the way up into the image on a subject that's in the middle. And this is really what's gonna allow me to capture as much detail as possible in the image. So you wanna try to be creative, as creative as possible with, it, with how you focus your image. And this is really what's gonna allow you to have uh, as much control to execute your compositions. All right, so another technique to focus on your image that uh, will ensure your image is in focus from front to back is to use a method called focus stacking. Uh, focus stacking requires that your camera take multiple photos, each time adjusting the focus a little bit further back and then combining all the photos to have a single image. Um, that's obviously as sharp as possible. Um, this will maximize your depth of field. But you might ask, can we just use a previous method of having higher aperture to maximize your focus? And unfortunately, we don't want to do this all the time. As I mentioned, diffraction starts to happen, and you can lose a lot of definition in your photos. Uh, so in the image above, for example, where the subjects are very close to the frame, plus you have a nice background, um, we would use this technique of taking multiple photos, each time adjusting the point, and then later combining the photos to make a single image. Um, although this is not or, or sorry, although this is ideally the best way to ensure your focus are in fo and are your your photos are in focus, um, there are a few rules that you want to keep in mind when you when you're using this method. Uh, first, always perform a photo stack on a tripod, as your camera will need to be as stable as possible when you're taking multiple photos. And second, ensure that each subject is in moving in the frame, as this will not only give you the best results but rather confuse the camera as to what it is that you're trying to focus on. So this method of photo stacking works best, for example, for macro photography in the studio or landscapes where nothing in your frame is moving. So using a combination of correct aperture plus focusing on various subjects in the scene and then combining the photo at the end is really what's gonna give you the best results and ensuring your entire composition is in focus from front to back. All right, so although I recommend for the most part to use autofocus as it's fairly quickly, um, very, yeah, very quickly and accurate, uh, there are times when manual focus will be beneficial as we need to tell the camera that what it is that we are trying to focus on. Um, many photographers believe that the on you're only really a professional photographer when you have the entire camera set up in, 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 foc in manual, and this includes uh, focusing as well. Um, and although this isn't always the case, there are times when manual focus is the best way to capture a unique shot. So learning how to use both is really what's going to give you the best results. 
Uh, one of the reasons that we might go into manual focus is when shooting a night scene, for example, like the image that I have here on the left. Um, cameras tend to struggle at night as the image lacks a lot of contrast, making it difficult to find a subject uh, at nighttime. Uh, so in this case, we resort to using manual focus on a single star, and this ensures that our sky will be as sharp as possible. Uh, when shooting these type of images, we also tend to create a lot of uh, photo stacks because we want to have the foreground and the background in focus, um, as well as the sky, for example. Um, plus, we're able to control the light that's entering the lens for these multiple shots. Um, the image in the center, for example, was taken also using uh, manual focus. Um, and it's great when you, when you want to capture a single subject in your, um, and you want to leave the background out of focus. Uh, so here I place my camera on the tripod and manually focus on the leaf and the branch. Um, I did this because the camera was alternating between focusing on the distance objects and the foreground. So it's important to remember when you're photographing small details in nature that may not be sturdy. For example, if the, if the wind is blowing the leaves, uh, you want to have an, a, a fast enough shutter speed where you can freeze the motion of the wind um, and, and freeze the object um, to be perfectly sharp in your photos. Um, the last image here, for example, on the right is also using manual focus. I wanted to only have the branch in the foreground uh, to be in focus. And so I switched my camera to manual focus and adjusted it accordingly to get this image. Um, so as you can see, there are many times when out of focus and manual focus each benefit from, from using one another. My tip is uh, to feel comfortable with using both and know when you'll, when you'll need to use each depending on the type of situation. Cool. So now that we have a better understanding of a few settings that will allow you to get sharp photos, um, and we talked a little bit about how each lens plays a part in your photo, the next thing I want to talk about is how to create creative composition using two methods. In the first slide, we're going to talk about contrast. And in the second, we're going to talk about leading lines. Um, I feel like these are two subjects that I always focus on in my, focus on in my outdoor shoots. Um, and they allow me to portray the environment in the most creative way possible. So the first tip is to take a look at the contrast in your environment. Um, contrast I like to define in two different ways. Uh, contrast in the colors and shades found in your shot, meaning the difference. And second, contrast in the scale between objects in your frame, which we're going to talk about in the next slide. So in this first example, I like to find compositions that create a strong difference between uh, one color and another, uh, or for example, between the lights and the darks in your image. One of the most uh, popular examples of contrast you can actually find when shooting sunrise or sunsets, as this is really when you are able to see the difference between your brights and your darks. Uh, when you're out photographing around these times, you will actually get very saturated colors, and you will create this very energetic mood, which you can use to your advantage to create images with a strong impact. Um, I also like to shoot um, high contrast images because you're able to uh, get silhouettes of subjects, giving this great moody feeling to your photo. It also helps helps to capture the eye of the viewer and put emphasis on the subject that you're trying to focus on. Uh, something that you do want to keep on the other hand, keep in mind on the other hand, is if your image has too much contrast, then part of your image will be fighting for attention, making it difficult for the viewer to focus on a single, single subject. So finding the correct balance between the lights and the darks is really what's going to give you that creative boost in your photography. The second way I like to define contrast is uh, on your image is by using scale to compare two different subjects in your frame. So this is done. Uh, this is done to draw the viewer to your photo and provide context of how subjects play a part in your composition. Uh, contrast in this scenario can be used to establish either how small or how large the environment is. Uh, this method is mostly known as a conceptual contra uh, contrast, and some examples include things like new versus old, uh, smooth versus rough. Um, and these are techniques that are widely used in various uh, different forms of photography and provide strong image, uh, imagery in your photos. Um, this technique gives emphasis to certain subjects in your frame, and it's a, way, it's a great way to create um, creative compositions in your work. In the example, for example, on, in, in the example on the left, um, I used a shot of a family rowing in the canoe, and I placed my camera directly parallel with the landscape. Um, my idea with this shot was to portray how large the background scenery is compared to the canoe in the foreground. Uh, the contrast in the colors also works great in the landscape as it has a very deep green tone, um, whereas the canoe has a very bright red color. 
So this helps to make the subject stand out from the rest of the scenery as well. Uh, similarly, the photo on the right, I had my friend standing on top of the cliff to show how small he is compared to the rest of the scenery. And again, like in the previous slide, you can see I, I used both the technique of color contrast plus scale to create this captivating image uh, that I actually took here in uh, Tilbury in Ontario. The next thing I want to mention, which I tend to use in my photography, is the use of leading lines to draw the viewer to your subject. Um, it doesn't always have to be towards the center of your frame, but many times it can be creatively done to create dynamic and powerful images that you can use to draw the eye to the desired subject in your photo. So to use this tip creatively, uh, first understand what it is that you're trying to draw your viewer towards. Uh, this is really what's going to determine how you will use your surroundings to frame your photo. So you want to try to scan your surroundings and find natural lines or even man-made structures. Uh, you can take advantage of man-made structures like the image on the right, for example, with the road going up, or even use natural made pads uh, leading the viewer on a journey towards your subject. You will find that the majority of times, uh, these lines begin in the lower part of your image and they guide the eye upward. Uh, some examples can include, for example, um, a river, a road, a log, or even a fence that give focus to a sunrise or sunset, or even a person in the background. Uh, since you want to include the foreground and background in your frame most of the time, uh, you want to consider what type of lens will give you the best uh, results for this these uh, scenes. Most of the time, using a wide-angle lens will actually give you the best results as you begin your leading line in the bottom of your frame and then slowly fading away until you reach the focal point. Um, wide-angle lenses are also great, like, as I mentioned earlier, because they give a lot of depth in your image and give the uh, perspective of how expansive the landscape really is. Uh, lastly, don't forget photography is about leading your viewer on a journey. So using leading lines in your photos is one of the best way to do this as you're able to decide what it is that you want the viewer to focus on or what areas to avoid in your uh, So natural leading lines are lines that I like to call uh, that are created by the earth themselves. And here we have three different examples. Uh, the one on the left is from Niagara Falls. And here I position my camera to follow the lines of the falls and lead the eye towards the sunrise on the left. Um, it allows the viewer to experience the entire image both from left to right and take in the beautiful colors, textures, and tones found in your scenery. Uh, the image in the center, I use the crack on the stones to lead the viewer towards the top center of the image. Um, it allows the viewer to take in the interesting patterns and colors found on the rocks, and then it leads towards the trees and the magnific magnificent sunlight uh, being separated by the crack on the rocks. Uh, lastly, the image on the right, I use the natural structure of the valley to showcase how large the landscape is. Um, the valley creates a very natural leading line, plus you add the aspect of the image, like the reflection in the water and the beautiful colors of the fall time, and it makes for a very powerful and captivating image. Um, on the other hand, uh, man-made structures um, you can also use as your leading lines, as you can see here. Uh, so here we have three examples that use objects to create very striking images. Uh, you can see in these examples that they're, that these images um, don't always have to have the leading lines starting from the center, but they can be from the side of the image, like the example on the right. Uh, here I used a road that goes from left and leads the eye towards the uh, center of the image. What's interesting about these type of images is that it really is easy to miss these type of shots or these uh, compositions when you're out shooting with the outdoors. Um, so always keep an eye, uh, keep an eye out and take advantage of your surroundings to let the viewer on a journey and guide your guide the eyes towards the subject that you want to get focused to. All right, so we just covered what type of camera settings are recommended for taking outdoor photographs. And we discuss we discussed two very powerful creative outdoor composition tips that are going to allow you to take your photography to the next level. Um, so the next topic that I want to focus on is how how to go about using your surroundings um, to explore and develop your craft in the field of outdoor photography. Um, it's normal for us to want to explore other parts of or of the world or even venture out to new regions that we have never explored. But I, I strongly believe that the best way to learn and connect with nature is to begin by exploring what's in your immediate uh, surroundings. Um, one of my favorite um, outdoor photographers, uh, you guys might know him, uh, Simon Baxter, actually says that the best way to progress 
the most in the field of, of, of outdoor photography is to prioritize connecting with what's in front of you first before venturing out into other territories. Um, and this is something that I always try to live by every time to every time I go to photograph outdoor scenes. Uh, so this new topic is about how to connect with your own surroundings and really understand what it is that you're looking at before you um, you begin to start to take your, your first photo. Um, I believe this is key to be able to connect with nature and really feel like you're part of the scene rather than feeling like you're an outsider. So my first tip is um, to begin by exploring your own woodland scenes uh, in order to create appreciation for the outdoors. Um, woodland photography is a subgenre of outdoor photography, which I started to explore and really dive into last year. Um, I would say it is one of the most challenging type of outdoor photography because of how unpredictable uh, your environments can be. Uh, therefore, it really puts your skill to the test every time you go out to shoot these type of sceneries. Um, I personally love to shoot for, um, or photograph woodland scenes because it depicts the most raw aspect of outdoor photography. Um, these locations are rarely touched by humans, so nature has a full control of manifesting itself in whichever way it wants to do. Uh, when you're going out to shoot woodland scenes, uh, you experience a lot of complex textures and patterns and realize how a branch and leaf and tree plays a part uh, in your creative composition. Therefore, it becomes um, you become very attentive to the details in your frame. Um, what I also find with, with uh, woodland photography is that you're able to express your personal emotions by the way you see the woodland. Uh, you may experience, for example, a very chaotic scene with lots of trees and branches coming in from every direction. But by the way you photograph that scene, it can paint a very different picture of harmony and uh, even unity. Um, you may even explore some locations uh, on two different days and each scene will tell a very different story. Uh, that's why I like to, or this is why I recommend anyone who is looking to explore outdoor photography to begin by going outside and experiencing woodland locations on their own. Uh, you're really able to connect with nature um, and primarily to build a relationship with the green spaces in your area before you actually start to take uh, photos of, the, of your surroundings. Uh, so this, for example, is one of my favorite shots of, of uh, woodland that I took uh, here in my area. Um, and I was really able to connect with what was in front of me before I began to take the photo. Uh, to most people, this shot may seem confusing and disorganized due to all the different branches coming in uh, from all the different angles. Um, plus the wide angle range of textures from the trees and the, mo and the moss. Um, but to me, it was the first thing that I was actually able to connect with nature and do justice to how beautiful the landscape really is. Um, so to add to the first tip, I recommend before you go out to photograph the outdoors, um, to really familiarize yourself with the area that you're going into and observe your surroundings before you start to take your first photograph. Um, this is really what's going to allow you to build a deeper connection with nature and in, ter in turn, uh, take more meaningful photos. So uh, the next tip for exploring the outdoor scenes is to understand that no matter the conditions, there is always a photograph to be taken. Um, the reason I say this is because many times in the past, I deterred myself from going out based on the weather conditions. Um, when I began photographing woodland scenes, I used to tell myself, that I, I would only go out um, during interesting uh, scenes, for example, with foggy conditions. And then I used to go out only during these times, which limited the number of times that I went out to, to take photos. Uh, but it was over time that I learned that the only way I was going to improve my outdoor photography was if I learned to work in conditions that were seen as, for example, unfavorable. Uh, this included rain or snow or even very overcast days, which to most people wouldn't uh, want to go outside for. So I recommend if uh, if you're someone who only heads out during these ideal times to to start to shift your, your view regarding these conditions to learn how to work with different lights. Um, that is um, one of the one of the best ways that you're going to be able to expand your photography and connect with uh, with your surroundings. Um, to add to this point and to wrap up on this tip, um, I want to mention that photographing nature is all about letting the scene do the talking. Um, your job as a photographer is to give life to nature and portray the story through the photograph that you're taking. So when photographing the outdoors, you really want to learn to be observant and understand how every object in your frame plays a role in the entire photo. 
uh, learning how to learning to understand and see each object in the frame as a single organism uh, will give you greater appreciation for the outdoors and allow you to understand the importance of either leaving out or including different elements in your composition. Uh, and you can tell different stories based on, on the scenario. Sweet. So uh, finally, to wrap up this presentation, and as the title explains, um, I want to talk about various ways that I like to stay inspired when I'm out shooting uh, outdoor scenes. Uh, one tip that I always tell myself, and as we spoke in the, in the previous points, is explore scenes in different times of the year. Um, and also in, that also includes weather conditions, um, because you're really able to challenge yourself and see beauty depending um, on the different times. Um, plus, you're able to, to appreciate every season and see how every, every, um, every condition plays a part in, the, in, in your overall shot. Uh, second is to be open to exploring different scenes uh, or even new genres of photography, which you may have never done before. I think this is uh, great because it teaches you two important factors of photography. First, you learn to really understand how your camera works by taking into consideration different lighting and different environment conditions. And second, you're able to gain a new sense of appreciation for various photographers in the field. Uh, sometimes we may feel stagnant and feel like we aren't advancing in our field of photography. So trying out new genres and seeing the world from a different perspective uh, is really what's gonna allow you to, um, to be a greater photographer um, and understand that you can take shots no matter what condition you find yourself in. Um, a great way to also explore the field of photography and continue to be inspired is to be open to collaborating with different creators in, in the field. Um, the photography community is very large and many people come in with uh, new ideas or fresh teachings um, and having an open mind and learning new tools is always gonna, what's gonna keep you on your toes and allow you to see the art of photography with a different, different eye. Um, and finally, the best way, which I believe you can stay inspired as well, is to set yourself creative goals. Uh, for example, you can photograph the same location at various times during each year, dif um, during different seasons, um, or even explore a new genre of photography or even try to revisit locations that you struggled with the first time you visited. Um, each of these goals is really what's gonna allow you to continue to be creative and motivated to go out to shoot your own photos. And lastly, and most importantly, um, always enjoy the process of taking photograph, photographs. As the saying goes, um, the journey is just as important um, as the destination. Great. So this uh, this wraps up my, my this wraps up my presentation for today. Uh, thank you guys for stopping by today. Hopefully you learned something new, um, and you continue to go to be inspired to go out and shoot some outdoor scenes of your own. Um, if you guys have any questions regarding any of the content that you watched today, or just want to come say hi, you can find me on my Instagram at Juan Rojas Pias. Uh, so thank you once again, and bye for now.